Welcome everyone to AFTD's 2023 Education Conference and our opening presentation, FTD 101. My name is Esther Kane and I am AFTD's Director of Support and Education. Whether you are new to FTD or farther along in your journey, we hope everyone will learn, engage, and connect this year. We want to thank Dr. Nupur Goshal and the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center for all their support with this year's conference. Dr. Goshal is an Associate Professor of Neurology and Psychiatry at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, and is a clinical investigator for the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Dr. Goshal is also the clinical co-principal investigator for an AFTD-funded biomarkers grant that focuses on examining the production and clearance of the protein tau in progressive supernacular palsy and corticobasal degeneration, as well as in at-risk individuals with FTD-associated gene variants. She is also the site principal investigator for all FTD, a multi-site consortium focused on studying the natural history of FTD and developing clinical trial-ready cohorts. Dr. Goshal, welcome. Welcome to Intro to Frontotemporal Degeneration, or Frontotemporal Dementia, or easier yet, FTD 101. I'm Nupur Goshal, Associate Professor of Neurology and Psychiatry at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. So let's get started and find out what these words mean and what entities they, they uh, include. So the F of FTD is the frontal lobe. This is the foremost, frontmost part of our brain. It's the part of our brain that interacts with the world around us. It's the part of our brain that really allows us to um, communicate uh, and interact with our environment around us. It's the filter, if you will. So when someone is having difficulties with their filter, we might have someone with frontal lobe dysfunction. Uh, in the center box, you see that uh, it has to do with order of events, so how important it is to have step A before step B before step C, and what happens when you don't quite do it in that order. In the bottom box, we see the emotionality, so kind of knowing what's appropriate, when it's appropriate, and when it isn't, and that attention to detail, all about the frontal lobe. So that is the F of FTD. On to T, that's the temporal lobe, and that's just the lobe sitting behind the temples above the ears. Uh, and this is also a complex region. It doesn't have just one function, although a key part of it is a center box again that has to do with language. So that's actually a fairly complicated thing unto itself. So that's the receiving of language, the comprehending of it, and then the expressing of it. So all those components are uh, coordinated in the temporal lobe. And then bottom right, we see memory as well. So an important function of the temporal lobe, a little bit less discussed today, but is also memory. So I guess that gets us to the F and the T. And to bring it all together is uh, one last cartoon to bring all the lobes together. So in the front, we see the frontal lobe, and that has to do with the planning, that ABC business, and the regulating of our emotions and our social skills. Uh, just below that is the temporal lobe. Again, all that language information and memory. We'll talk briefly about the parietal lobe here in the top right. And that has to do with our understanding of where we are in 3D space and how we kind of interpret sensation. That'll come up a little bit later. So that's the F and the T of FTD. You might recall that when I mentioned D and FTD, I both said degeneration and dementia. Let's look at it through the lens of dementia. Important to know these terms so we can make sure we all have the same vocabulary as we move forward in this tour of FTD. So when we talk about dementia, we're talking about individuals having difficulty with their cognition. And the way we come to learn about this is through detailed history taking of the patient and a loved one, a caregiver, and some testing, whether that's bedside testing or more formal neuropsychological testing. What we're looking and listening for is difficulties in at least two of the following areas. Most people equate dementia with difficulties with memory and not being able to recall new information, but that's not all that dementia represents. It's actually a, clear, a key distinction we need to make for today's conversation. We're looking for folks who may be having difficulty with their judgment, decision making is tougher than it used to be, difficulties with visual spatial abilities, meaning how we navigate through the 3D world. Already alluded to language issues, the speaking, the reading, and the writing, as well as people who've had fundamental changes in their personality, just really out of character for themselves. So when we listen for and are looking for possibly up to two or more of these areas being affected, we might say someone has a dementia. So bringing it all together, 
let's start thinking about defining FTD, the frontal temporal degeneration, as clinical presentation. And what I mean by that is how a person looks to me when they're coming through my clinic door into my office. What might I be listening for? What might, might I be seeing? What I, might I be entertaining? So here's what we start calling a spectrum of disorders that falls under FTD. So we'll go left to right. So in the lower left with ALS and FTD ALS has to do with muscle weakness types of dis disorders. So these people are having muscle weakness. We'll do a deeper dive in these in just a moment. And these individuals may also then have issues with their cognition and behavior. As we move just up ahead of that, we see behavioral variant FTD, not so much about the muscle issues, but really about the cognition and behavior changes, really even that filter issue predominantly. The next three going left to right have to do with uh, language difficulties of various sorts, and not really any muscle issues at all. And then we move to the right, see individuals who are having Parkinson's-like uh, conditions of muscle rigidity, not so much weakness, but stiffness. And this is kind of all the entities that we can consider, consider broadly that fall within FTD. But let's get to know each of these a little bit more in detail. Starting with, again, we're going to do that sweep from left to right. So amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, definitely a mouthful, much easier to say ALS. It's also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. You see Lou Gehrig here to the right. He was a Yankees baseball player. So the disease as such is sporadic, is age-related. These are progressive disorders that we see more commonly occurring with increasing age, but that can be as early as in one's 50s, 60s, and 70s. Is rare, so it's about four to six cases out of every 100,000 births. And again, as I initially uh, brought this term up, it's a muscle weakness scenario. So you might see some rippling muscle movements under your skin. That's what fasciculations are. But again, these are progressive disorders, progressive weakness and muscle atrophy or losing of bulk. And depending, you can well imagine on which muscles are affected, your face, your swallowing muscles, your breathing muscles, like the diaphragm, that's what contributes to death occurring at a fairly rapid pace in about two to five years. What we've come to learn in, uh, over time is, again, these are not singular, unique disorders, but they blend over and bleed over into one another. So if you ask the right questions and do the right screens and listen to those caregivers, we hear that up to 50% of individuals with ALS may also have that frontotemporal dementia. We'll keep moving in our survey of FTD to behavioral variant frontotemporal degeneration, so BV FTD for short. These are folks, again, with frontal lobe difficulties, so the filter is an issue. They have florid personality changes. This isn't just someone who's changing as the course of aging. They are fundamentally different uh, in their interactions with the people around them, and they don't seem to see it, so they have dramatic loss of insight. They don't think or nor see these changes in themselves. They tend to be socially inappropriate. Recall that the frontal lobe is how we interact with the outside world and regulate our appropriate and inappropriate behaviors. Um, language centers just behind the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, so they can have some language difficulties. But notably, since we're talking about a frontal lobe predominant scenario, uh, they're not often having memory issues early on. Now, once we're several years into these disorders, they all start morphing together a little bit. So that's BVFTD. Moving on to the language variants. So we've more recently been hearing more in the press about primary progressive aphasia, PPA. So aphasia has to do with language dysfunction, primarily a progressive issue with language, PPA. Three different flavors of language variants. The first one being non-fluent language problems. So this is the getting out of your thoughts. So you know what you want to say. You're having great difficulty speaking, writing clearly. And nowadays with texting, email, we're seeing that um, the, the things you're saying or trying to communicate are agrammatical, meaning connecty words are missing. So ball, boy, kick. Not that the ball, the boy is kicking the ball. And there may be spelling errors, like square being spelled S-W-A-R-E. A little bit different, kind of close, but definitely not right. Next flavor is semantic dementia. So this is the receiving of language. So these individuals have absolutely no difficulty speaking fluently and fluidly and with a lot of words, but really not saying a whole lot at the end of the day. And so you ask them to pass you an apple, they look a little confused and they pass you the spoon instead. So the object and the word and the name attached to it have been dissociated. And these folks are a little bit more uh, like Alzheimer's disease with some memory changes. This is again, temporal lobe also has to do with memory. 
The last variant I'm going to add here, although we think about it a little bit differently, is logopenic variant, LVPPA. So this is more of the commonplace word finding difficulty, you know, the thing, except this is happening with more frequency. There's pausing, they're hesitating, trying to find that word. Um, it is a PPA, but it's most often associated in the more Alzheimer's spectrum. But just for completeness, I inc included that here today. We're moving now into the muscle rigidity and stiffness disorders on the far right of the original spectrum. First one being cortical basal degeneration or syndrome. So we often call it CBS. It has a Parkinson's-like uh, flavor to it. So one side affected more than the other, being asymmetric, and yet typically less responsive to the standard treatments. You can give these people the Parkinson's medicines and they don't seem to do uh, have an impact. So they tend to be rigid. We have dystonias, which is the fancy term for writer's cramp, although it doesn't just have to be limited to your hand, so any muscle can cramp up. And myoclonus has to do with unpredictable jerking movements of muscles. Apraxia has to do with uh, learned tasks. So we all learned how to tie our shoes or brush our hair. Those become harder to negotiate. Um, and this has to do, this involves that parietal lobe in the back behind your ears area of the brain and has to do with how we understand the world around us. So you can show somebody their arm, they'll recognize it as an arm, but not their own. Uh, but this is not, again, dissociated from some of the other ones we've talked about already. These folks can have some frontal lobe filter issues. This is the part that we um, understand the 3D world around us and number processing can be affected. And they too can have these language problems. And so most typically associated is the, uh, the agrammatic non-fluent type. To this end, there was a composer named Ravel, and here's a play on the play on his name called Unraveled. So he had both cortical basal syndrome and specifically had the non-fluent variant of PPA. And this is a play by Jake Broder that kind of recounts uh, Ravel's own uh, trek through the disease, as well as someone in the modern times uh, kind of running in parallel. But uh, Ravel, importantly, had been an avid swimmer his entire life. And towards the end of his life, he was having a difficult time swimming and kind of remembering the strokes, those things that had been really well learned, but very difficult uh, to kind of put together a sequence of events that were important to get that, the job done. And then the last one in this category of that Parkinson's-like but not Parkinson's uh, disease is progressive supranuclear palsy. All these names are a mouthful. We've handily gotten down to a couple of letters, PSP. So also Parkinsonian in terms of the stiffness and rigidity, uh, but they tend to be less uh, responsive to standard Parkinson's treatments. These individuals often have difficulty moving their eyeballs where they want them, so really not being able to look down. Their stiffness isn't in their limbs, but rather in their trunk in the center of their body, the core, if you will. So you imagine this person trying to look down, moving their eyeballs down or trying, not being successful, have a stiff body, so they lean backwards to try to look down, and that's how they often fall. So a lot of falls um, and instability as a result. But again, they're not just limited to having rigidity issues. They too can have cognitive and behavioral abnormal abnormalities that we've already kind of uh, ascribed to BVFTD. So this, just to recap then, is the um, number of disorders that kind of come broadly under the umbrella of FTD. They each have their, from the left again, the muscle weakness entities, frontal lobe specific behavior changes, language issues, and then those all kind of intermix, but towards the right again, the muscle stiffness or rigidity entities. So this is how I look at people when they come to me through the clinic door, and I'm trying to listen for these aspects and see uh, how best I can uh, categorize them. But let's take a slightly different approach or a deeper dive, if you will. So we can look at FTD and say, all right, we kind of know what parts of the brain are affected, um, but why is that? So it turns out that we can rethink FTD through the protein deposits in specific brain regions. So same lineup, if you will. Going from the left, you'll see proteins like TDP43. And TDP43, as you go across this rainbow here, shows up more than once. So it's a protein, if you will, good protein gone bad. And in the case in the lower left, it's affecting motor neurons. So uh, brain cells that control uh, and when affected result in muscle weakness. When that same TDP43, if you will, is in the frontal lobe predominantly, you get the BBFTD. And when that TDP43 is in the temporal lobe in the language centers, you get the language variants. And then towards the right, another protein shows up called tau, and its longest form has to do with motor control area. So that's where you get that rigidity in, in cortical basal syndrome and PSP. 
So this is going from the patient coming to me through the door, knowing what parts of the brain are likely affected that are giving those symptoms, and now having a better appreciation for the proteins in those parts of the brain that are causing the problems. But we can take it one step further. So we can think about FTD by looking at the innermost part of the cells. Let's look at the genes, the blueprints in our cells, and see if they're those are affected and if there's errors in those blueprints, and those are mutations. We all have the genes, but not very many people have the mutations, those errors in the blueprint. Again, same lineup. So if you go from left to right again, so we see some of the same players. So we see C9 ORF72 is a gene that we see in a lot of these muscle disorders on the left and then kind of throughout. Um, it's not kind of restricted to any one of these disorders. GRN is progranulin. MAP-T is the gene behind that tau protein I mentioned a slide or two ago, and that has a couple different places where it turns up in terms of BVFTD, uh, one of the PPAs, CBS, PSP. So now we've gone from person coming in through the door, we're doing a good history, we're doing some bedside testing, we're able to understand and ascribe kind of their symptoms to specific parts of the brain. We now understand that they're um, which proteins are affected, and maybe even which genes. So hopefully today I've given you a bit of a survey, FTD 101, as we kind of uh, spelled it out for you today. So have a, some common terminology, and at least an understanding and a working knowledge of what we're going to be talking about at this conference. Thank you.